mighty dog puts the family at risk. What you need to know for a day on the water with your pet. Perfectly pampered poodles and a heroic kitten saves its family. All these and more on this week's Animal Attractions. You are such a good kitty. Hi, I'm Megan Blake with Animal Attractions TV, and this is Toot Sweet the Travel Kitty. And yes, I talk to my cat. But I'm not alone. Over 95% of cat owners admit that they talk to their cats. They're very good listeners. It's fascinating all the things that we can learn about our pets. For example, did you know that cats can be either right pod or left pod? Who knew? And that's what Animal Attractions is all about helping us learn as much about our pets as we can so we can have the best relationship with them possible. We hope you enjoy the show. Right, Toot? Yes. Toot Sweet the Travel Kitty. Deacon is a Chesapeake Bay Retriever, and the only way that my husband would let us get a dog is if we got a Chesapeake Bay Retriever because he comes from the Eastern Shore of Maryland, and he's familiar with that breed, and he loves them. Before we knew it, he was 95 pounds and, and a beast. Brian and Tracy Cook and their daughter Chloe had owned their dog Deacon for over four years and had become used to its aggressive traits. And when he bit my husband, um, we kind of sat back and didn't really take it seriously. But when he bit me, who was always the nurturing one and the one that took care of him, and um, then that was just a wake-up call. We envisioned him being in the family, with the family. You know, it just didn't really work out that way. He, he wasn't that dog that was that would mellow. When we would take him on walks, he would um, start barking and growling at other dogs. We had to pull him tight. We started thinking, oh no, we, we have a problem here because you couldn't necessarily control where he was going and when he was going. He's bit a couple family members coming and going into and out of the house. He became very protective of his food bowls so that if we went to um, feed him the, um, the food outside, he would get uh, start to growl and get aggressive. So we would drop the bowl really quickly and back off. The aggressiveness just continued to grow. He just became very unpredictable. And you just never knew which deacon you were going to get. But then, something even more dramatic happened. <coughs> Last October, we had twins. <laughs> and the concern started mounting from the standpoint of once these children start moving around, crawling, and then walking, um, would they pull his tail? Would they go after his food? Or would, they, would Deacon go after their food? And how would we control that? Deacon would come up and grab their toys or their stuffed animals and run around the house with them. No, Deacon. No, Deacon. What are you doing? No. His loud barks would scare the children. <laughs> So we had to get to the point where we wouldn't even let him be around the children unless we were outside or had them within you know, a distance from the dog. So Deacon never really got to spend a lot of time with the children um, because we were afraid. And so we had to isolate him from the family. And when we did that, we didn't spend as much time with him playing with him and playing ball with him. We spent a lot of time away from him. And we had a choice to make of either investing in training or getting rid of him. The vet even last time had to put a muzzle on him at the vet and said that we needed to get some professional help with him. So when she called me, she asked me what were her options. And I said, uh, we can train the dog, but you have two little kids and I can't train them. So you have to be very careful how you deal with this dog around those kids. How you doing? Ronald White. How you doing? Dog hey, trainer. How you doing, sir? Fixed how you doing, doing ma'am? Do you have that list I have you to make out? He's a biter. He's mm. bitten all of us. Bit the veterinarian. I met everybody, and everybody has something to say about this dog. Now you're on everybody. 
The grandfather even showed me the scars that the dog left in two spots. I'm going to take your dog for 30 days in training. I'm going to make your dog my dog. And then I'm going to train him, bring him back home, train you for seven days. And then each time I leave your house, your dog goes back to my house because I'm going to see can I train the family. Right. Okay, then. I'll see you in 30 days. All right. It's nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Come on, let's go. Come on, let's go. What makes a dog become a biter is how you raise the dog, how you play with him. Some of the problems could have come from me teasing him as a pup, just saying, I'm going to get this or I'm going to get that from you. And, and he became very protective and possessive of his items. The husband would play that game. I'm going to get your toy. I'm going to get it. He would also do it with the food. And the dog is five years old. And he's never been trained. They always played the game. And then when they go feed the dog, he thought that he was playing the game. And so that made the dog aggressive. And this dog was the baby before the real babies came. Well, when the real babies were born and came into the house, the dog went outside and he never came back in. I knew what that dog's problem was. He wasn't getting enough attention. He was just getting meaner just by being outside. He's been out in that pen for several months. And so I snapped him up in my kitchen and just get to know him. And I can talk to him. And I let him know that he's, he's going to be loved. You like it in here, don't you? And you're going to become friends. Is that right? Huh? Is that right? Once he was here for about three or four days, then I released some dogs on him outside to play with him, to get him, because they said he wasn't social with other dogs. There them boys. Come here. Come here. Then each day, I would let more dogs out on him. At least five or six dogs, just let them play out in the yard like they had a dog bark. He learned to share with his toys. He didn't fight them. He didn't go after them. There he did is. great. There it is. He got it. She got it. She got it. After I knew that he was ready and me and him bonded, now I knew it was time to take him through his training to give him some structure. He made people fear him, so I had to make him fear me. And that's where that pinch collar came into play. The pinch collar doesn't hurt him, but he can feel it because it's what the mother dog does to her puppies. It's pecking orders. Heel. The first thing we take him through is Place. to heal, to walk on the Place. side of you, to let him know that he's no longer a leader. A leader is out front when you're walking. So you need Place. him on the side of you, for he'll depend on you. He has to know his commands, just like he knows his name. That's a good boy. Place. I would have some hot dogs or chicken or something in my pocket. He took it from my hand, I was able to pet him, and then he got used to it. Now when you stick your hand out, he's not trying to bite it, he's trying to lick it. So once I took him through his obedience, Place. now it would get to the serious problem and it was protecting his food and being aggressive around things. And I was going to use that word, leave it. Leave it. Because that was part of his structure. That was part of his training. Leave it. Leave it. To know the word, leave it, and to move away from it. Leave it. And so we put his food down, tell him to leave it, and take it from him. To let him know I was in charge. I took the dog back home. Now I knew that the hardest part was going to be training the owners, and I was concerned about those kids. I can't describe how amazed I was at the transformation in Deacon the first Sit. time I saw him. Sit. Sit. Just. It, just in his behavior yeah. was so much more docile and he was so calm. Seeing Deacon for the first time after Coach had him was, was truly amazing. Then we're going to take it away from him. I can't believe he's acting like that. What did you do with Deacon? <laughs> it was very obvious that we needed as much training as Deacon did. That's it. He, he responded and actually did what Coach told him to do, and, and as coach trained us, Deacon behaved the same with us. Okay. Okay. I told the owners, if they're not consistent with this dog and they don't have time for this dog, then I can find that dog a home. So the dog is well trained, but the kids can never take him by the mouth, pull his tail, and they should get near this dog or do something to this dog, and he's, he will bite them. And I wouldn't take no chance with him. Not at all. Okay, let's go. Okay. Stay. 
taking Dinkin back to see if the owner's gonna keep it. I think they should get another dog, just like him, a puppy, and let them raise him with those kids. And they don't have to even worry about it. Yeah. Deacon's home! Yeah. Hey. Hey, hey, buddy. Hey, buddy. Hey, Deacon. Hey. 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 You did good. Hey. It's the last day. Hey. Good. So, I hope you keep the training up. If you have any hey. questions, hey. you be sure to call me. Deacon. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, you're welcome. Thank you, Ryan. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank
Most people tend to think of poodles as girly dogs. But poodles were originally bred as hunting dogs and trained to retrieve a hunter's prey. They were especially effective as water dogs. This is Scarlet Rose. She's my standard poodle. She's mahogany red, which is one of the reasons why I picked her. One day I saw a lady and she was walking this huge poodle. I didn't even know they made them that big. Anyway, I had to have one. There are three categories of poodle, standard being the largest, then miniature, and toy. They each can be prone to eye problems and other medical issues, so it's important to have a good relationship with your veterinarian and to take care when making your first poodle purchase. It's going to be important to find a reputable breeder and make sure that you get a good history of their breeding line as well as maybe even interview some people who've adopted poodles from them in the past. He's looking for a puppy, a little poodle puppy. Hey, Which one do you like? Which one's your favorite? Do you like that, like one? that one? Once you have acquired one into your household, it's going to be important to set up a good relationship with your veterinarian so he can check out your puppy to make sure that there aren't any hidden birth defects. With a good relationship and health plan with your veterinarian, you should be able to have a long and healthy relationship with your puppy. We, we have so much fun together. I love her hair so much that I dyed my hair to match hers, as you can tell. <laughs> Our favorite thing to do is ride around in the convertible. It's hysterical because she's got, she's got her little sunglasses. Because from behind, you know, both of us, we got the red hair flying. And we've been told that people say, oh, we thought there was another person there. Then we, we pull up to a red light and she's like, hey, look at me. <laughs> it's so fun. My understanding is that dogs are pack animals and humans replace that pack aspect in their lives and they are so bonded to humans. I mean, these dogs absolutely love people and you, you get a great deal of affection from a dog, uh, particularly poodles. They just seem to be very affectionate and do so well with children particularly. Poodles make really wonderful family pets. It has to be someone that is willing to dedicate at least an hour a day of grooming. They're, they're very high-maintenance dogs. These dogs uh, require a lot of attention, but they give you a great deal of affection, and you get it back ten times. They're wonderful dogs. They are very social, so if you can't take them with you or if you can't spend enough time at home with them, I would advise you not to get a poodle. <laughs> Typically, the coat has, is a very coarse texture, very curly texture, but a lot of it can be corrected with certain foods, vitamins, and grooming techniques. You know, if they're brushed often, the oils from their skin helps to, to lubricate and make the hair softer. But Scarlett, she has a very good quality dog food that I feed her, and she takes vitamins, and, and of course the, the grooming. So her hair is really, genuinely, it's like silk. I, I dress her every day in a different dress. Most times we, we color coordinate to where her and I match. I know, it's, it's over the top, but we do it. And it's just fun. And she has a fur coat. Uh, it's, a, it's not a real fur coat. My favorite color is pink, so we do have a tendency to lean more towards the pink. We have many pink dresses. always so happy and happy to see me and if I lay on the couch and watch TV that's where she wants to be whatever I'm doing that's where she wants to be and that makes me happy you walk in this door and the greeting that you receive from these dogs and they're on your lap and they just they just never run out of energy show you love all the time I know that sounds kind of odd for for a man but uh, it's really a lot of fun poodles give you the the greatest love is the most unconditional love I've ever experienced in my life. It makes me happy. It gives me that warm, fuzzy feeling on the inside. Common household plants and plants in your yard may seem harmless, but there are over 200 species that may potentially be toxic to your cat or dog. Don't get real worked up and go and dig up your yard or throw away all your house plants just yet. 
and if they don't chew on the plants, there's really nothing to worry about. The best time to figure out what plants you have in your environment is now, before there's a problem. Remember, your veterinarian is not a botanist, and they won't necessarily be able to identify the plants even if you bring it in, but they will be able to treat the signs and symptoms. Reactions can vary depending on the type of plant and the amount ingested. A mild reaction might include just some salivation from irritation from the plant locally in the mouth, but a more moderate reaction might include some vomiting or diarrhea. However, some reactions can be extremely serious. Reactions can include organ failure, such as liver and kidney failure, seizures, coma, or even death. Some of the most innocent looking plants can actually be the most toxic, like Easter lilies, tulips, or daffodils. Even some holiday plants like mistletoe and holly are poisonous. If you believe your pet has been in contact with a poisonous plant, here's what to do. First of all, remain calm. Attempt to determine the type of plant your pet has eaten and the amount and the time since you think your pet ate that. Contact your local veterinarian immediately to see if there's anything that you can do at home before proceeding into the office. And do not induce vomiting without consulting your veterinarian first. This is a very abbreviated list of the possible plants that can be toxic to your pet. If you want more information, please visit our website at www.animalattractionstv.com. But remember, the simplest way to keep your pet protected is to make sure you know which plants are in your pet's environment and keep them out of reach. A story like this comes around maybe once in a lifetime. A cat saves its family from a fire. It's an awesome story. Here, take a look. My first foster home I went into when I was about one, and then I went around to about 20 or 30 more. Probably one of my favorites was one that had a cat, and so I got to help take care of the cat, and I actually got to see it give birth to kittens, and I really wanted one, they were so cute, and that's when I first decided that I wanted a pet of my own. We fell in love with Kate when we first met her. She was so beautiful and so wonderful, and she fit in our family so well. And it was just love at first sight. We really were excited about her continuing and being with us and, and having our families whole. Well, one of the first things we noticed right away was her affection for cats, kitties, any kind, it just didn't matter. And of course, she had never had one. Even though we had one in the family, she had never had one of her own. So the first weekend she was here, that was our objective, is to go get a cat. The day that we first got Sammy, I knew what I wanted. I wanted a girl, I wanted to be cute and cuddly, and we looked and we looked and we couldn't find one. Finally, in like the fifth store, we found the perfect cat. It was a boy, not a girl, but still cute and cuddly, something that I could love, and that was mine. He had his own personality. Like when we met, it was just like we latched onto each other. He purred to me in a different way than he did with anyone else. It was a very special friendship and so I could like do anything with him. Sammy is a Siamese, half Siamese actually, you know, and half American short hair. One of our friends said anything with the Siamese mix was the best pet for a child. Mm -hmm. Sammy did so well with our family and with Kate. When Sammy was little, Katie would always cuddle and hold him and Kate, Sammy was such a wonderful fit. I think having the cat was the real catalyst and it made her adjust to the family mm -hmm. right away. It was just uh, the, whole, the whole element of having the cat, the family, and a new experience was just fantastic. If I didn't have Sammy, I'm not even sure if I would be here. We had a fire at our house. Um, one night I was sleeping, it was just like every other night and that I had gone to bed, everything seemed to be fine. And then a fire started, and Sammy was sleeping with me as usual, and he tried to wake me up, and he couldn't. So he went into my mom and dad's room, and he tried to wake up my dad, and he didn't. He sleeps really soundly. And then he went to wake up my mom, and she woke up with the fire alarm, so she ran to come and get me, and she woke up my dad, and we ran outside. 
if it weren't for Sammy, then who knows if we would have gotten out. The night of the fire, I was sound asleep, and I'm laying there, and all of a sudden I feel Sammy licking me and licking at my neck, which he's never in our bedroom. And I wake up, and all of a sudden I can hear the smoke detectors and the, and the sounds going off, and there's smoke filling the house. And I yell at Bill, not, dial 911. And all of a sudden we were awake and knew what was happening. Yeah, and I dialed 911 immediately, you know. And Donna jumped up and ran to get Kate, and all three of us made it the point of the stairs there and took off down the stairs and out the front door. One of the biggest surprises we had is we didn't even hear the smoke detectors going off and the house was just totally full of smoke. We could hardly see going down the stairs. So when the fire department arrived, we found out that there was so much smoke in the house, but it was, had originated from a small fire down in the furnace room. But the small fire had made such a large amount of smoke in the house and that it was so dangerous we were well, actually, the fire department said that, you know, we could have died in that fire because most people die from smoke inhalation, not the fire itself. There was so much smoke in the house. If Sammy hadn't have woken us up, who knows what would have happened. He was a true hero. Sammy is a hero. He isn't even a pet anymore. He's more like a member of the family. I think, really, that he's just special. How many cats do you know save their family? And so because of that, he's become one of us. We love him, and he loves us. Sammy's such a wonderful example of a pet hero. If you'd like more information on his story or any of the other stories you've seen here today, check out our website at animalattractionstv.com. We're so glad you could join us. Right, Disco?